This week's shout out goes to Deviant Art creator Marcherin. To view more spectacular pieces like the ones before you now, be sure to click on the link below and provide as much support as you can offer to this exquisitely talented artist. We here at the Dr. Moxmo Readings channel offer you the deepest amounts of our blessings to you and your future endeavors. If you too would like to have your art featured on this channel and receive a shout out in the process, be sure to send me your art for either this channel, creepypasta content, or perhaps fandoms I find myself involved in to either my email, Twitter, or Tumblr. All links and handles are on screen now and in the description as always. Now, without any further ado, let us delve into tonight's reading. I think about her almost every day. How can I ever forget her? Mila was my childhood best friend. I spent every summer in my grandmother's village. Mila lived in the same neighborhood and our relatives had known each other ever since they could remember. Almost from the moment I first went to the village, Mila became my best friend. She was a mischievous girl with a happy, cheerful smile, long blonde hair, and big blue eyes. She looked like an angel, but deep down, she was a tomboy at heart. I was more timid and shy, with brown hair and green eyes. We were almost complete opposites, but together, we were inseparable. All summer long, from morning till night, for ten years, we were always together. It was a seaside village, and we often went swimming in the warm, salty sea, or lay on the cliffs, basking under the warm rays of the light. Every moment I spend in the dusty, boring city, I would be looking forward to the summer and seeing my best friend again. Then, something happened. When we were 14, we had a serious quarrel. It was over something really stupid. A boy named Vince. He was very handsome and drove all the girls crazy. He was three years older than us, but Mila and I were head over heels in love with him. And in the end, of course, he chose Mila. I was so disappointed. We had a big argument, and I stopped talking to her. Long before the summer ended, I gathered my things and went back to the city. I didn't see Mila again that year. Every day, I thought about her and how we could make it up. I knew how silly I'd been, and I waited for the months, weeks, and days to pass before I could see her again and say sorry. The next summer, I returned to the village. Even though it was already late in the evening when I arrived, I went straight to our place by the sea. Somehow, I knew she would be there, and she was. I saw her sitting on the cliffs. She had her back to me. The sea was surging, and waves were crashing against the rocks. For a moment, I was afraid she would still be angry with me, but when I shouted, Mila! She turned around to look at me, and her face broke into a smile. When I ran over to her, she said, I've been waiting for you. I tried to hug her, but for some reason, she moved away. Then I noticed how nervous she seemed. What's wrong? I asked. You have to get out of here, she replied. Why? Please, I beg of you. Just go. I'll see you soon, but not now. Soon, though. She wouldn't explain why, but she insisted that I go and just waited until I left. When I got back to the house, my grandmother was waiting for me. She was a little angry and asked me where I had been. I told her that I met Mila. Grandma paused for a long time and looked at me dumbfounded. She felt my forehead. What did I say wrong, I thought, quite puzzled. 
My grandmother sat me down, and what she said shook me to the core. Oh, I'm so sorry, sweetie, but Mila died. It happened a month ago. She drowned. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I had just seen her with my own eyes. I had just talked to her, and she was... dead? It turns out that a month earlier, Mila had been walking along the cliffs when a big wave came along and swept her into the sea. Three days later, her body was found, washed up on the shore. Then I realized that the place where we loved hanging out was the exact place where Mila had been swept off the cliffs and drowned. That night, the waves were crashing against the cliffs. I would have been swept into the sea, just like Mila. That's why she was telling me to leave. She came back only to spare my life. Although it's been almost a year since that time, I'm still afraid of the last thing that Mila said to me. How she said she would see me soon. Not then, but soon. The little girl who owned the pink diary was only eight years old. Despite her young age, she knew more about the world than most kids her age. If you were to glance at the front of her pink diary, you probably wouldn't pay much attention to it. Many kids her age keep a diary in which they write all their random thoughts and silly little secrets. But if you were to open her pink diary and look inside, you might be shocked by what you would be finding. Every page was filled with childish writing, the ink blurred by tears, and the pages stained with blood. Her aunt and uncle beat her every day. They hated the fact that they were forced to spend their hard-earned money on her. They took out all of their pent-up frustrations on her, punching and kicking. Although it was a long time ago, she could still remember her mother's loving smile, the warmth of her hug, her father's kind words, and the feel of his kiss on her cheek, her brother's cheerful smile, and the sounds of his laughter. But it was all a sad and distant memory. Her mother and father were dead. They had been executed, but they were innocent of the crime for which they had been convicted. They had been framed. The man who framed was very rich and very cruel. Her parents were poor and naive. They didn't stand a chance. The man had committed a brutal murder, and to save his own skin, he decided to blame it on someone else. He chose the little girl's parents and he conjured a false case against them, planted evidence, then bribed the police and the judge. Her parents were convicted of the murder, and they were hanged by the neck till death. The little girl and her brother were left alone in this harsh, unforgiving world. They found themselves homeless, sleeping on the cold streets, and digging through trash cans for food. It was winter, and the little girl caught the flu. She became terribly ill. They didn't have any money to pay for a doctor, so her brother was forced to steal. He stole the money. He got a doctor for his sister. With what little money there was left over, he bought her a little pink diary. When he gave it to her, he told her that it was an open ear, always ready for her to pour out all the secrets of her battered soul. As time went on, the little girl got better, but her brother was not so fortunate. The police arrested him for his theft, and he too was executed for his crimes. Once again, the little girl's life was torn apart, and all her dreams were shattered into a million pieces. She was back on the streets, alone this time, and barely existing. One day, a kindly old man stumbled across the little girl. 
She was lying in the street and was nearly dead from starvation. He took pity on the girl and gathered her in his arms. He carried her to the nearest police station and asked them to take care of her. The police managed to track down her relatives, her aunt and uncle, but they refused to look after her, though they were forced to take her in. Her aunt and uncle were mean and cruel. She was beaten every day. As horrible as her life was, she never thought of ending it all. She couldn't do that. She knew she had to be strong. She knew she had to go on. She knew that she had to suffer through what the world threw at her. In her diary, she wrote down her most private thoughts. She wrote about her hopes and dreams. She had only one ambition in life, and as impossible as it may sound, she wanted to go to school. She wanted to study hard. She wanted to go to college. She wanted to become a judge, one that would pass on justice in the most honest and perfect fashion. That way, she thought, she could help others like herself. She would never allow herself to be corrupted. She would never accept a bribe. She would bring villains to justice. As time passed, the beatings got worse. Her aunt and uncle showed her no mercy. Her body was bruised and battered, but her soul was still alive, and she was determined to fulfill her ambitions. On one sad day, she was playing in the hallway when she accidentally knocked over her uncle's favorite vase. She watched it hit the ground and shatter. The sight of it reminded her of the day where her heart broke in the same fashion. She knew the end had come. She knew her uncle had a tremendous temper. She would not be awaking the next morning. She ran to her school and left her pink diary on her teacher's desk. She didn't want her brother's precious gift to be thrown away after she was gone. When she got back to her house, she was hoping she would still have time to see another minute of the world, but it was too late. Her uncle was already waiting for her at the door. He held his blackjack in his hand, and there was a drunken stupor on his face. He grabbed the little girl by her hair and pulled her inside. The next day, she was found dead by police, lying sprawled on the cold floor, covered with dried blood. The teacher found her little pink diary on her desk in the morning, and when she opened it and read what was inside, she immediately passed it on to the police. Her uncle was arrested for murder, and the pink diary was presented as evidence at his trial. A jury of twelve honest men and women found him guilty. The judge sentenced him to be executed, and was hanged by the neck until death. The little girl's body was buried in a grave, embraced right next to her parents and brother. About two years ago, I bought the game Animal Crossing New Leaf for the 3DS. It was quite fun for a while, and me and my brother poured countless hours into it. Eventually, the time came when we got bored and moved on to more new and exciting games. I have always tried to convert my parents into gaming, and somehow I thought that Animal Crossing would be simple enough for them to get into and perhaps develop as a hobby. I let my mother set up a house, and she soon got into the game in a big way. As a child, she had been diagnosed with polio and was bound to a wheelchair. As you can imagine, she was confined into our home, except for the one or two times when she'd either leave to go shopping or go to church. Spending all day at home in a wheelchair seemed to bore her so much. The relief that Animal Crossing provided her was kind of amazing. She played it so much that we couldn't help but get a little joke out of the fact that she was getting so much enjoyment from a game directed towards children. 
Eventually came the day where she even completed all the in-game objectives a player might encounter. Whenever I saw her playing, I thought the game must have long stopped being interesting to her. Yet, there she would sit, tapping and clicking away happily. Her condition got progressively worse, and eventually, she was no longer able to play. A few months later, she passed away. I had long since forgotten about Animal Crossing, and I hadn't played it in quite some time. Today, however, I decided to visit the village again and see what was going on. Weeds had grown everywhere. The villagers wondered where my mother and I had gone. Then, I came up to my mailbox and was full of letters with presents, all from my mother. Every letter was pretty much the same. Always thinking about you, thought you'd like this present. Love, Mother. Even though I'd stopped playing, she continued to send me presents. I look back now and how I made fun of her for playing even after she'd done everything. I realize now that she was probably spending all of her time getting presents for me. One evening. The shopkeeper was about to close up for the night when he realized there was still one customer left in his store. It was a pale and thin young woman in a filthy dress. She was standing silently in the corner and seemed to be waiting for him to notice her. The shopkeeper asked the young woman what he could do for her. She would not look him in the eye. And without a single word, she stepped forward to the counter, an arm extended and pointed at the refrigerator behind the counter where the storekeeper kept his milk bottles. The storekeeper picked up a bottle of milk and set it upon the counter. The girl, again, pointed to the refrigerator. Taking the hint, he removed a second bottle of milk and set it on the counter as well. Suddenly, the shopkeeper heard something fall off a shelf behind him, but when he turned back around, he was in shock to see that the young woman had disappeared, along with the two bottles of milk. He checked the door of his shop and found it was still locked. He searched around the store, but there was no sign of the mysterious woman. The next day, just at closing time, the young woman in the filthy dress appeared again, almost out of nowhere. One moment the store was empty, and the next, she was standing at the counter, pointing at the refrigerator. This time, two empty milk bottles sat on the counter. The storekeeper looked into her hollow eyes and saw streaks and stains from many tears making paths in the dirt on her face. He was a compassionate and generous man, and he knew that this woman was in need of help. So he took two new bottles of milk and set them on the counter for her. He turned his back to allow the poor young woman an opportunity to leave without having to pay. He never heard the door open or close, but when he turned around, sure enough, she was gone. On the third day, the storekeeper was determined to find out who this woman was and what her circumstances might be. It was possible he could give her husband a small job sweeping out the store or stocking the shelves. Again, just before closing time, the young woman appeared out of nowhere and stood pointing at the refrigerator. The storekeeper put out two more bottles of milk on the counter and tried to ask the woman some questions. Just as he was about to speak, however, the cash register drawer flew open and fell to the floor. When the storekeeper looked up again in shock, the woman had gone. This time, he was even more determined to find out more about her, so he locked up the store and took off down the road leading out of town. He caught a glimpse of her ahead as she turned off the road and walked down an old overgrown path. He followed her, creeping through the woods until the path led him to the town's cemetery. 
The cemetery gate stood open, and he heard a strange sound coming from inside. He followed the sound deeper and deeper into the cemetery until he reached the newest graves. Now he could make out the sound clearly. It was the distinct sound of a baby crying. What terrified him was that it was coming from beneath him. Standing over a fresh grave with no headstone to mark it, he could plainly hear the cries of a baby growing louder and louder. Grabbing a nearby shovel leaning against a tree, he began to excavate the shallow grave and soon reached the wooden coffin. Falling to his knees and scraping the dirt aside, he tore open the coffin's lid. There before him lay the dead body of a young woman. He couldn't tell if it was the same woman, but she did wear the same torn and filthy dress. Her skin was grey, and her eyes were just hollow sockets, and in her arms was a cold and hungry baby still alive and crying, and in the coffin beside the baby stood two empty milk bottles. I've heard that a mother's love knows no bounds, and clearly it can overcome even death.